Um, so good afternoon and welcome to the Brandy Boomers Lecture Series. We're very happy to have you join us today. Um, so in 2007, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging uh, Education Committee started the Brandy Boomers Lecture Series in order to suggest practical steps to both improve and maintain brain health, as well as to promote healthy lifestyle choices amongst the most populous generation in history. The MCSA Education Committee, which was founded in 1996, has three objectives. The first, identifying education needs of healthcare providers, seniors, caregivers, the public, and developing responses to meet some of these needs. The second, enhancing positive image of the aging process by addressing stereotypes and myths about aging. And the third, dissemination of research on aging. So today's guests are Yasmin Svachi and Angie Chen. Yasmin, Yasmin is a fourth year dietetics student at McGill. She is an ex-competitive rhythmic uh, gymnast representing Team Canada and decided to pursue her passion in nutrition to better understand how different goals, disease conditions, and athletic realms can be improved through nutrition. And Angie Shen, she is a fourth year dietetics student at McGill with a unique cultural background distinct from Canada. She loves exploring diverse cultural foods, their effect on health across various age groups, and her passion lies in tailoring nutrition menus, snack options, always mindful of respecting cultural preferences. So before continuing, we would like to remind you to please mute your microphone. And if you have any questions, you can write them in the chat box on Zoom. And for this presentation, if you have any earphones, we would encourage you to use them. So now I'd like to invite Angie and Yasmin to start the presentation. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Kayla, for the introduction. So like she mentioned, my name is Angie, and I'm here with my colleague. Um, my name is Yasmin, and I'm here with my colleague, Angie. There we go. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. So today, we want to be sharing a little bit of information about inflammation and how nutrition and food kind of ties into it all. Um, before we get started, I'm just going to mention that we have a few fun activities planned during our presentation. So some of them could be like true or false questions just to keep us on our toes and to get us warmed up as well. So if you would like to turn on your cameras so that you can give us a thumbs up to cast in your votes during those activity times, that would be awesome. So we can see all your wonderful faces as well. Hello. And if you're not comfortable turning on your camera, that's completely fine. And you still want to participate in the activities. You could see at the bottom of your screen, you should have a reactions um, icon. And you can just put the thumbs up for what, whenever I say, if you think it's true, put a thumbs up. You can go ahead and click the thumbs up. So whatever is most convenient to you. But if you can turn your cameras on, that would be awesome as well. Um, and also, if you have questions, feel free to add them into the chat box and we'll try to get to them as well. But if not, we're also going to have a Q&A period at the end. So, yeah, so let's get started. So first, right off the bat, we want to start with a little bit of a true or false question to get us warmed up. The question being or the statement being all types of inflammation are bad for the body. So if you think this is true. I want to invite you to either put a thumbs up into the screen or put a reactions with a thumbs up if you think it is true. If you think it's false, yeah, false. Okay, I see someone with a thumbs down. Well, I see someone putting an X. Okay. So I'm seeing that a few people think it's false and in the chat box, let's see. Okay, so the answer is actually false. So you guys got that right. Um, depending on the type of inflammation and how long it lasts, it can actually be a sign from our body to let us know that it's protecting us and it's working to heal a damaged part of our, let's say, our tissue, for example. So let's take a deeper look into how our body's response actually works. So what is inflammation? Here we have a simple example. Let's take a splinter. So for those who don't know, a splinter is when a piece of wood actually pierces the skin. Um, this piece of wood in this image is labeled as something harmful. So what happens when it enters is it actually activates our immune system. So our immune cells, these purple guys here, are going to go to the site of the damage and try to heal the damaged tissue. So this invading species could also be bac bacteria or virus, and our immune system is going to be activated in the same way. 
So normally, this is how our body will respond to an invader. So we have, let's say here, we have a bacteria or virus. Um, you have something called antibodies, which will attach themselves to these invading species. And this serves to let our immune system cells, which are the purple guys, know here's the invader come to us. So it attracts those immune cells so that it can actually um, go straight to the source of the invading species, which here is the bacteria and virus. So this makes it easier for the immune system cells to identify those invading species. So this is how our body normally works. So this is good. This is good that our body's reacting to something that's foreign and outside of our body. Now, remember in the beginning that I did mention, it depends on the type of inflammation and how long it lasts. So here I want to introduce to you two types of inflammation. We have the acute on our left and chronic inflammation. First, I'm going to talk about the acute inflammation. This is essentially response to sudden body damage. So this can be uh, even like a paper cut or the splinter that we previously spoke about. And this is short term. So our body is responding to something harmful that entered and it's making sure to address that harmful agent. Now it becomes a little more problematic when we go into the chronic inflammation, which is on our right side here. So this is when your body continues to send inflammatory cells, even when there is no outside attacking agent. So there's no more danger but our inflammatory cells are still being sent and now they're actually attacking healthy cells. So this is when it becomes a little more problematic. Some symptoms you might experience with inflammation include, but certainly not limited to these guys. Um, you have redness at the site of the injury, fatigue, fever, loss of appetite, abdominal pain, and swelling. So these are some things you might experience with inflammation. So now you might be asking yourself, what causes this type of chronic inflammation? It's definitely multifactorial. It's got a lot of different factors playing into your risk of inflammation. Um, but here are a few. You have sedentary lifestyle, which means you're not active in nature on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, a lack of sleep, either in quantity or quality. Excess alcohol consumption. Smoking. Chronic stress having an untreated acute inflammation. So for example, if you leave an infection untreated for a long period of time, you have exposure to toxins like industrial chemicals, having a high body weight, being older in age, and lastly, autoimmune diseases like lupus and arthritis are also possible causes of inflammation. So now that we got a little bit of a background on what inflammation is, the types of inflammation, how does it actually affect our body and what goes on inside our body, Let's get into the role of nutrition and how that plays into inflammation. So we're going to be talking about something called anti-inflammatory agents. So various different foods has these anti-inflammatory agents in it. And as the name entails, there are properties found in food that help fight off or reduce inflammation in the body. So there are four types of anti-inflammatory agents we'll be talking about today, and they include phytonutrients, antioxidants, omega-3s, and fiber. And we're going to get into those in detail soon as well. But first, I wanted to introduce something called Canada's Food Guide. So I'm sure some of you have seen this already. I'm, it's been circulating around. And this is basically what we want to base our day-to-day -day meals to make sure that it's nutritious and it's balanced. So this is what Health Canada recommends. They want half our plate to be full of vegetables and fruits a quarter of our plate to be full of protein foods. And this is typically where we also get our sources of fats from as well. And then we also have a quarter of our plate filled with whole grain foods. And lastly, we want to make sure to you um, drink water as the beverage of choice with our meals. And you may also notice that Canada Food Guide promotes um, a more plant-based eating style. But let's take a look as to why that is. So first to really understand why Canada's Food Guide promotes a plant-based eating pattern, we need to speak about something called phytonutrients. So what are they? They're essentially naturally found in plants and they have a role of protecting them from any outside threats. So this protective role in plants, you might be wondering, how does that translate into the human body? Well, once we consume these phytonutrients from food, it actually does have a prevent, um, protective mechanism as well in the human body. Um, 
among these mechanisms, it includes helping prevent damage to cells and tissues and helps strengthen our immune system. So overall, these beneficial protective effects also translate into the human body, which is great. This is why we want to be consuming more of these. But looking back at Canada's food guide, keeping in mind that phytonutrients are originally found in plants, what food group do you think we can find phytonutrients in or are very high in phytonutrients if we want to include it into our diet? So we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to be talking about each food group and then you can either put a thumbs up into the camera or go into your reactions box at the bottom and put a thumbs up, a check mark, and we'll go through it like that. So if you think it's fruits and vegetables, we could put a thumbs up if you think it's fruits and vegetables that we can get phytonutrients from in our meal. Okay, I see you on thumbs up too. Okay. Okay, I'm seeing a few thumbs up, so I think you're getting the hang of it. Yeah, and anyone think it's from protein foods? Okay, I see a few. And lastly, from our whole grains. Okay, so I see a few thumbs up for all of them. So let's take a look into the answer. So typically, you can get phytonutrients from various types of the food groups, but it's easiest to find them in our fruits and vegetables section. Um, and this is why Canada's Food Guide promotes the quote, eat the rainbow. So we want to be eating in color. Um, as I mentioned, that phytonutrients are naturally found in plants. It wouldn't be a surprise to say that good sources of these phytonutrients are found in those vegetables and fruits. So typically, the type of phytonutrient you get or you're receiving from your food is dependent on the color of the food. So for example, we have our white and beige vegetables and fruits that are high in anthoxanthins, which is a type of phytonutrient. The red ones are high in lycopene, the orange and yellow high in carotenoids, green high in chlorophyll, and lastly, the blues and purple vegetables and fruits are high in anthocyanins. Now, it's important to note that spices and herbs are also great sources of phytonutrients, and it's a very easy way to up your sources of phytonutrients in a meal while enhancing the flavor. Um, and also, it's important to note that depending on the color of the phytonutrient, it will have different effects, health benefits. So for example, the whites and beiges help decrease cell damage and heart disease risk, while your lycopene helps decrease heart disease and cancer risk. You have your carotenoids that help promote eye health and hormone regulation. Chlorophyll helps promote wound healing and colon health. And lastly, anthocyanins help improve cholesterol levels and decrease your risk of breast cancer. So that's something to note. So now I have a quick question again. It's a true or false. So we're going to do it the same way with either thumbs up or thumbs down if you think it's false. Um, fresh vegetables and fruits are higher in phytonutrients than when frozen. So if you think this is true, you can go ahead and put a thumbs up. If you think this is false, you can put a thumbs down. Okay, I see a few thumbs up. And some people think thumbs down. Okay. Okay, so we have a few, a mix of different opinions. So the answer is actually false, that um, freezing these vegetables, it's frozen at their peak ripeness. So the freezing process is really just to preserve them at that ripeness and to make sure they don't go bad. So that, that freezing process doesn't change the nutritional value of the fruits and vegetables. And it can actually be a, a more cost-effective way if you... Um, when you're cooking and if you want to include more color into your meal, because you don't have to worry about any fruits or vegetables going bad in the fridge. It's a lot more convenient. So that's definitely an alternative and something to think about when you're choosing um, fruits and vegetables. So now we're going to look into our next anti-inflammatory agent, our antioxidants. So what are they? Um, they're agents that help provide our healthy cells um, some protection from free radicals, which is what we see in the middle in the red. So what are free radicals? They actually attack our healthy cells and will cause them damage. So this is something we want to decrease. We want to decrease the level of free radicals. And the role of antioxidants in this all is that they help neutralize the free radical so that they don't attack our healthy cells anymore. Now, I know this concept might be a bit out there, 
and hard to grasp. So let me give you a little bit of a metaphor. So let's think of antioxidants as a mediator in an argument between free radicals and healthy cells. So your free radicals and healthy cells are having an argument, they're fighting. And our antioxidants typically helps calm down the free radical so that it stops bothering our healthy cells. So this is why we want, we want more antioxidants from our diet. We want to be upping this level. And now you might be wondering, how can I do that? We have different sources. And you can also notice that foods that are high in phytonutrients are also high in antioxidants. So that's a plus for us. Some good sources include blueberries, dark chocolate, farro, which is a whole grain. You have broccoli, onion, nuts and seeds, avocado, carrots, and green tea. But it's definitely not limited to these. There are lots of good sources of antioxidants, but these are just a few. And now seeing this, I just want you to think about, if you want, you can include it into the chat box. Um, if you're not, if you don't have the capacity to do that, just think about it and kind of like, we're going to walk it through together. So I'm thinking, what's a snack we can make that's high in antioxidants, that have a lot of antioxidant sources in them? So if anyone has any input, any suggestions, I have one in mind, but I want to see what you guys are thinking as well. If you want to put it into the chat box, if you want to unmute yourself, that's also an option. Granolas. Okay, I see someone wrote granola. Chocolate and nuts, I think that says. Okay, so we have a few options here. These are all great. I was also thinking we can make like a yogurt parfait, which is kind of like a mix. You can also use both the ideas here that we have in the chat box, which is the granolas and the chocolates and nuts. You can have a yogurt parfait with Greek yogurt, top it off with blueberries and chopped nuts and seeds and also chopped dark chocolate for some added sweetness. And there you go. You have so many different sources of antioxidants there and it's a filling snack. Plain carrots. That's also a good, good option. Now we're going to go into our fat section. So when we're talking about fats, there are two types that we want to address. We have our unsaturated fats on our left and our saturated fats on our right. So our unsaturated fats to start off, they're typically liquid at room temperature. One of the main unsaturated fats that we want to focus on and I'll be talking about later is our omega-3 fats. Some examples of these unsaturated fats include salmon, nuts and seeds, and olive oil. And secondly, we have our saturated fats. So these are typically solid under room temperature. Some examples of sources of saturated fats are pastries, fried food, red meats, which includes veal, lamb, beef, pork, and goat, and high fat dairy products. So in the context of reducing inflammation through your, through your meals, we wanna be choosing more of the unsaturated fats options. Now let's take a look at a little activity now that we talked about our unsaturated fats a bit. I want to apply what we just spoke about into real life because I know sometimes when we hear about these things and we're learning something, it's kind of hard to apply immediately into real life. So I want to make that transition a little easier with an activity. So imagine we're going grocery shopping and what we want is a dip or a spread that we want to put to pair with our whole grain crackers. So here we have three options. We have hummus, B, we have guacamole, and C, we have peanut butter. And these are all our options that we wanna choose from. You can also choose all of the above if that's what you think is correct. Now, what we want is a healthy source of fats as our dip or spread. So we're gonna do the same way. You can also put it in the chat box, thumbs up into the camera or with a reaction. If you think it's A, the hummus, we have a thumbs up. Okay, a few thumbs up. Okay, now if you think it's B, the guacamole. Okay, we have more thumbs up. C, peanut butter. Okay and D all of the above. So for the ones who put thumbs up for everything, I'm assuming it's all of the above. Okay, there we go. In the chat box, let's see, we have all of the above. And 
So Ali, I did see your comment about elaborating on saturated versus unsaturated fats. If you want, we can we can discuss that further at the end of the presentation so that we can discuss all the questions all at once. So we have a few people saying all of the above. Some people think it's one over the other. The answer is D, all of the above. So these are actually all great sources of healthy fats to incorporate in a snack with crackers. Um, specifically with guacamole, I find it's extremely convenient and easy to make. You really just need a fork to mash it down and you can customize it with different herbs and you can also put tomatoes and red onions into it if you'd like. Um, you can definitely make your own hummus and peanut butter as well. I just think you need more of like a durable high speed food processor of some sort. But if you have that, you're all good. You can definitely make those as well, but they're also great sources of um, plant-based protein as well. Something to consider. Okay, so now we're going to talk about those omega-3 fats. Like I mentioned, we were introduced them under our unsaturated fats section. They're also known as an essential fat. This means our body doesn't make these fats on its own, so we have to get it from our diet. And some benefits to omega-3 fats are supporting joint health, they do lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, and lastly, they support mental health and mood. And these are one of the some of the main benefits of omega-3 fats. And it's also important to note that they're, they have a role in maintaining tissue healing and cell repair. So lots of benefits here. Now that we know the benefits, let's look at some sources. Where can we get our omega-3 fats from? There are three types. You have our EPA, DHA, and ALA. And you have the full names under there if you're curious. Um, first, we're going to talk about sources of EPA and DHA. You have some fish like salmon, tuna, mackerel, and herring are great sources. Also shrimp, seaweed, and omega-3 eggs. And I'm not sure if many of you know this. Some of you may be wondering, what's the difference? What's the real difference between a regular egg and an omega-3 egg? Well, it's actually in the diet that the hens have. The hens that eat um, that are meant for the omega-3 eggs have a diet that's 10 to 20% flaxseed, which are great sources of omega-3. And this actually changes the content of omega-3 in the eggs quite substantially. So a regular eggs contain about 30 milligrams of omega-3, whereas an omega-3 egg contains, depending on the type and the size of the egg, about 100 to 600 milligrams of omega-3. So substantial difference there, something to consider if you want to be up in your omega-3 intake. And then we have the other type of omega-3, which is ALA. And some good sources are typically plant oils like flax, soy, canola oil. You have flax seeds, chia seeds in the whole that are great sources as well, walnuts, avocados, and soybeans. And you may notice that there is more of an emphasis on plant sources of fats as well, alternatively to animal sources as well in Canada's food guide. So this is because we wanna make sure that we're having a more nutritious approach to a better lifestyle and more balanced plate. And once you hear omega-3, typically it's also linked with omega-6. So you might be wondering, what about our omega-6s? Do we, are they recommended for in the anti-inflammatory case? Well, let's first look at the benefits of omega-6. They're very great um, in providing beneficial roles in nutrient absorption and improving our cholesterol levels. And sources are mostly from vegetable oils, like palm kernel oil is a very high source of omega-6, um, sesame oil, and you have soybean oil. And now in the context of reducing inflammation, it's the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6s that matters most. What I mean by this is what you see at the bottom left of your screen you see that the omega-3 is larger than the omega-6. This is done intentionally because in the context of reducing inflammation, we actually want to make sure that we're having more omega-3s versus omega-6. So that ratio is what matters. If it's the opposite, let's say we start eating more omega-6s and less omega-3s, and that ratio is the opposite of what's recommended, that could actually trigger inflammation in the body, which is why we want to make sure we're consuming a higher portion of omega-3s versus omega-6s. And it's also important to note that highly processed foods are higher in omega-6 options. So this also kind of like gives you a hint as to why we want that proportion to be more towards omega-3s. 
Now, just another question to get us thinking, maybe just to internally think to yourself, huh, what do I use? What types of oil do you use when you cook? And do you use a specific type of oil for different temperatures? So you can go ahead in the chat box if you want, or if you want, just think about it. Think about what you use, for example, for a dressing versus if you're putting it on heat and you're stir frying something. Do you use the same oil? Do you use a specific type of oil? Okay. Olive oil, I see avocado oil. Okay. So we use different types of oils. So I ask this because it's important to know that different oils have their own smoke point. Okay, I see Robin says olive oil for salads, avocado for cooking. Okay, avocado oil for higher temperatures. So you guys kind of get the idea of it. So there are different types of oils that are more suitable for different temperatures. And this is through the concept of smoke point. So what is that? It's basically when oils start to emit smoke and release harmful substances. And what does that do? It causes inflammation in our body, which is why it's important to know the appropriate oil to use for each um, temperature. So on the left of the screen, you see the chart with different oils that we can use at different temperatures. Um, for example, for high heat, it's better to use canola oil or avocado oil. So I see some people wrote that in the chat box, which is great. Um, for medium low heat, olive oil would be a better option. So now I'm going to introduce our first recipe. We have two recipes to introduce today. Our first one is chickpea shakshuka. If you don't know what shakshuka is, it's native Tunisian North African cuisine. Um, and the cost per serving for this recipe is about $2.96, which is relatively cost effective compared to what you would get at a brunch place, I feel. <laughs> and it's also very versatile in nature. So you can really swap out the ingredients for whatever you have on hand. For example, greens of choice. If you want to swap out one of the greens for something that's going bad in the fridge and you want to use up quickly, that's an easy swap you can definitely make. Um, different types of canned beans, it doesn't have to be chickpeas, and also you can switch it up with different spices and herbs to make it more towards your liking. So you must have received this through email, but this is the flyer for the recipe for the chickpea shakshuka, and I have a quick question, um, and we can walk through this together. What types of anti-inflammatory agents do you see in the ingredients list? Now I know the ingredients list is quite small here, so let's zoom in. And this is, these are the ingredients we have. Let's walk through this together. So we have a few ingredients, first starting off with extra virgin olive oil. So that's actually a great source of our omega-3s. And then we have the garlics and baby spinach. Um, the spinach provides antioxidants and the garlic, great source of our phytonutrients. So our whites and beiges, which is our anthoxanthins. And then you have the crushed tomatoes, which is also high in phytonutrients, the lycopenes, and then chickpeas. So they're also great sources of plant protein. So this is one of the other reasons why we like this recipe so much. It's because it's high in plant-based protein, which is our chickpeas and our Greek yogurt. Um, and we also have animal protein from our omega-3 eggs, which are also good sources of omega-3. And lastly, we have our thyme and ground pepper, which are great sources of phytonutrients. So now we're going to play a video, which is of us cooking the meal. And it's very simple, and it's really not demanding in nature. So I hope you like it. I'm going to walk you through it as well. So this is our chickpea shakshuka recipe video. So first and foremost, before we start, we want to make sure we're practicing food safety which means that we're washing our hands before we cook to make sure we're not contaminating our food. So now we can prepare our ingredients. So like you saw on the flyer, we have our chickpeas, dried thyme, pepper and salt, our chopped garlic, extra virgin olive oil, and then we have chopped baby spinach. You can also use frozen. That's very cost effective as well. Crushed tomatoes, Greek yogurt, and four omega-3 eggs because this, is a, this serves four portions. Um, another reason why we love this recipe so much is it's extremely cost effective. You can we're using canned chickpeas and canned tomatoes, which are both non-perishable food items. So you don't have to worry about anything going bad in the fridge. And like I said, you can easily swap out ingredients for whatever you have on hand in the fridge. 
So if you don't have chip chopped um, baby spinach, you can easily use another type of greens you have in your fridge and swap it out to see whatever's convenient for you. So now we can uh, heat up a large skillet over medium heat. We're gonna add in our olive oil and our chopped garlic. And you're gonna keep stirring that around until it starts to brown. This will take a few minutes. And then we're gonna add in our chopped baby spinach. You can use frozen as well. The idea is just that we wanna stir it until it starts to wilt. This really just takes a minute or two. Then you're gonna reduce the heat to medium low. And then you're gonna add the other ingredients. So the tomatoes, the yogurt, the chickpeas, and the salt. So for me, I do not like doing the dishes after I make a meal. And I know sometimes it's a lot of dishes that accumulate. This recipe is one pot. So you don't have much equipment to be used and it's extremely easy in terms of cleaning up after yourself. One of the main reasons why we love this recipe so much, it's super easy and one pot. So once you include all the ingredients in, you just mix it up and let it simmer. And, and this is for more in terms of presentation. What I'm doing is I'm taking the back of my spoon and creating shallow grooves into the sauce so I can um, drop the eggs in. This is more to see so that once it cooks, you can see the eggs separated. But if you would rather beat the eggs on the side in a bowl and then pour that over top, that's definitely an option as well. We just did it so that presentation wise, you can see the different eggs. And also when you're portioning it out, everyone gets one egg. Um, and also for this, you want to make sure that the egg yolk. Well, this is really according to preference as well, but I like that the yolk is a bit runnier. So that's up to you. And then you can top it off with your dried or fresh thyme, and then you're gonna cover it and let it simmer for about six to eight minutes. And then you can remove it from the heat and you're gonna top it off with your ground black pepper. And that's it, you're done. It really doesn't take too much time at all. And you can pair it with your favorite whole grain bread or wheat, whole wheat couscous or quinoa of, your, of any sorts to make it a more balanced meal for your source of carbs. I hope you liked that. And we can definitely resend the um, recipe. I think there was a chat box. So now I'll pass it on over to my colleague, Angie. Thank you, Yasmin. So another reason why we chose shakshuka as our recipe is because of how vibrant it looks like in terms of its color it's, and uh, its appearance, right? So we can see the red from the tomato sauce, the greens from the spinach, and the chickpeas also provides another contrast in color. So having a colorful plate definitely help us to make our meal or dish look more appetizing. So tying this back to our Canada's food guide here, as you can see on the screen, just a quick question for you. And I promise you it's a very easy one though. So which food group do you think help us adding more color on our plate? So let's do thumbs up again. So thumbs up if you think it's fruits and vegetables. I see a few thumbs up um, and thumbs up if you think it's proteins and fats. No. And thumbs up if you think it's whole grain and starch. So I can see the result is very obvious. Yes, it is fruits and vegetable. So not only our day visually very appealing, but on top of it being a rich source of antioxidants and phytonutrients, it also packed with good amount of fiber. So now I'm going to introduce you our last anti-inflammatory agent, fiber. So what is fiber? Fiber is a beneficial carbohydrate found mostly in plant foods. It comes into two forms, soluble and insoluble, but both are contributing a feeling of fullness and thus helping us maintaining in a healthy weight, weight, sorry. It also regulates our blood sugar level and lowers the cholesterol level. Most importantly, fiber also plays a role in feeding our gut bacteria to help our bowel movements go smoothly and minimize any potential discomfort in our stomach as well. So you may wonder why whole grains instead of refined ones. So let's break it down here. As you can see on the screen, the picture here. 
So the whole grain with their brand, endosperm, and germs layer intact, which are nutritional powerhouses loaded with vitamins, minerals, phytonutrients, and of course, fibers. So this combo brings a bunch of benefits, such as fighting inflammation in our body and keeping our blood sugar in check. On the other hand, the refined grains lose the nutrient-rich bran and germs layer, leaving the only lost nutrient dense, the endosperm layer here, as you can see the white layer. So that's why we highly recommend you to choose whole grains rather than refined grains to ensure we get a full and complete nutrient package into our bodies. So now let's delve into the world of whole grains. I'm curious, what's some uh, typical whole grains that you usually consume or cook um, at home? So feel free to type your answer in chat box or you can just unmute yourself and answer the question. Yasmin, did you see any answers in the chat box? So while, oh, sorry, Yasmin, you were- Chickpeas, okay. lentils, uh, yeah. in the chat box. Beans, pulses. Okay. Great, those are all good answers. Thank you for answering. So the, the key point that I really wanna highlight here is the idea of, of exploring whole grains that surround us. So just take a look at this, um, the picture on the screen. It's just a snapshot, but you can already see the, uh, the incredible variety of options available out there, right? So what might surprise you is that some of these grains are right here in Quebec. And so I'm going to show you an example here. Has anybody seen this green before? To give you a hint, I also uh, provide you another picture on your right-hand side. So you can see this green is commonly used in making a very delicious uh, dish called crepe. Anyone want to guess what it is? In French, it's called sarrasin, to give you a little hint. Yeah. <laughs> More obvious one. Oh, in the chat, Any Jen says buckwheat. Donna says buckwheat. We have a few people Good say job. <laughs> buckwheat. Yes, 100% correct. So the answer is buckwheat. As I mentioned, it's a local grain grown in Quebec. Uh, it packed with protein, fiber, as well as B vitamins, making it extremely nutritious. However, buckwheat also has a rich history in other countries as well. So you can see in Asia, where people use it to make a type of noodle called soba, which is a very trendy and popular dish, especially in Japan and China. Whereas in Eastern Europe, where it is used to make a type of porridge called kasha. So just a little fun fact for you to know. So now moving on to drinks. I'm interested to know what is your first choice of beverage to keep yourself hydrated? So let's do thumbs up again. Um, thumbs up if your first choice is water. Um, I'm expecting all of your thumbs up. <laughs> Are they? So, our first choice is always making water as your first choice of beverage because it is the best and easiest way to quench your thirst without adding extra sugar. While it is true that sometimes water can seem a bit boring for all day consumption, and I completely agree. So I have discovered several ways to elevate my water drinking experience by mixing it with uh, fruits and vegetables. And occasionally I will put some herbs and spices into my water as well which not only encouraged me to stay hydrated, but also introduce extra flavor, extra color and minerals in my boring water. So as you can see on the screen, there are a lot of ideas you can follow with. For example, you can mix blackberries, orange with a sauce of ginger, or even as easy as squeezing some lemon juice into your water and same as peppermint. If you're craving for a more like a fresher taste, you can also combine both vegetable and fruits into your water. So as you can see on the right hand side, 
there's an example for you, which combine watermelon, cucumber, and mint. So the idea here is get creative with whatever you have in your fridge and let them infuse overnight and boom, enjoying your drink. So what about coffee and teas? A good news is that both tea and coffee offer health benefits as well. And thanks to the presence of polyphenols and antioxidants, known for their anti-inflammatory properties. However, I'm not saying that you should consume these as a full replacement of water because overconsumption of caffeine can sometimes lead to adverse effects such as headache, stomach upset, um, sleeping problems, as well as increasing the risk of osteoporosis. So my, so the key message here is moderation is key. So according to Health Canada, it is recommended not to exceed 400 milligrams of caffeine per day, which is roughly equivalent to four to five cups of coffee. So if you're trying to decide if you should get a second cup, cup of coffee in the late afternoon, you may but always keep in mind with the additional sugar and cream you will be adding on to your coffee as well. In terms of alcohol, um, Health Canada has a new guideline that really wants to stress the risk of using it. Unlike before, uh, compared to the older one where they said having two to three glasses of wine per week was okay, but now they're saying it's way better for your overall health to not drink any alcohol at all. So in general, the more you drink, the more risks, the more risks you take on, it's, uh, especially heart disease, stroke, um, and ultimately leading to certain um, type of cancers as well. To help you figure out how much you are drinking, the guideline also provides you the standard amount for different common types of alcohol we have daily. So in a nutshell, the guideline is pretty clear that no amount or type of alcohol is good for your health, whether it's wine, cider, uh, spirits, um, even a little bit can be detrimental to everyone. So lastly, let's talk about sugary beverages like Coke, Pepsi, and Sprite, which pack a punch of sugar. They can quickly spike your blood sugar level, increasing the risk of other health problems as well, including tooth decay and ultimately leading to inflammation in your body. So when it comes to these drinks, our suggestion is very simple. Less is better. And swap it out for water, which is the easiest way. Or again, you can add some extra color or flavors into your water as well. And now you might be thinking about what about food juices like orange juice or 100% unsweetened options from the store. Well, according to uh, Canada's food guide, it's a good idea not to go overboard on those food juices, even if they're freshly squeezed. So opting for whole foods is a better deal because they come with a broader range of nutrients. So the bottom line here is we are aiming to cut down on a concentrated sugar down in those food juices as well. So dessert time, introducing our second recipe, cranberry oat milk crumble bars. So these are not only budget friendly, less than, which costs less than $2 per square, but also make for an ideal late afternoon snack. And here you can also pair with a cup of coffee or tea as you like. Uh, I believe all of you have received the flyers by mail, but I would like to highlight a few key ingredients before we jump into uh, the cooking demo. So the start of the show here is our cranberries, sourced locally and in season right here in Quebec. But I highly recommend you to explore other foodie options as well. You can also use blueberries, raspberries, or even a berry mix for a more delightful twist. Um, you can also customize your own flakes. So here we use uh, roll oats for the flakes, but in case you want to try other grains option, which I highly recommend you to do so. So I also provide several options on the screen. As you can see, the buckwheat flakes, spell flakes, as well as quinoa flakes. But I would say um, all flakes are much more accessible and more cost effective. But again, feel free to change the ingredient and play around with it at home. 
So zooming into our ingredient list, my question for you again is what kind of anti-inflammatory agents can you see in this list? Um, so to save time, I'm going to work through together. So let's start uh, with the cranberry jam. So cranberry are rich in polyphenols and antioxidants that, that can also help you to reduce some inflammation in your body. So for the crescent topping, we have oats and whole wheats that are high in fiber and phytonutrients. And lastly, uh, as Yasmin highlighted before, olive oil, which is not only a healthy fat, but also increasing your omega-3 intake. So now I'm going to play the cooking demo and to see how we're gonna make this lovely bars. So now introducing our second recipe, cranberry oatmeal combo bars. So let's start up uh, the jam layer. So in this layer, we only need three ingredients, the frozen cranberries, maple syrup for sweetness, and lastly, cornstarch for thickening. If you don't have cornstarch at home, no worries. You can simply replace it with either chia seeds or flax seeds, and all the details are written in our pamphlet as well. So now let's combine all the three ingredients in a saucepan over medium heat and stir frequently. And once you see the cranberry bursts, reduce the heat to low and continue stirring and mashing using your spatula. And once it's thickened, remove from heat and set aside. And now let's do the crust and topping. So here, there are all the ingredients we have. We have whole wheat flour, uh, brown sugar, baking powder, salt, olive oil, fresh lemon juice, and lastly, 2% milk. And remember to preheat your oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. So now let's combine all the dry ingredients in a large bowl. So we want to make sure all of the dry ingredients are well combined so you can simply use a wooden spatula to do so. And then we take oil, lemon juice, and milk into the large bowl and continue mixing it until a crumbly dough forms. Once all the ingredients are prepared, let's line up an eight inch pan with a parchment paper. So here, remember to reserve one third of the dough for topping and take the remaining dough into the pan's bottom. So for extra firmness, my strategy is to use the back of my spoon to make sure the layers are firmly pressed. Then spread the jam evenly over the bottom's layer using your spatula again. So here um, you wanna make sure that the jam is completely covered the bottom's layer so that we can have a distinctive layer later. And lastly, put the remaining dough on the top. So here you don't have to press firmly as the bottom's layer. You can simply just sprinkle on the top. And then we put the bars into the oven and bake for 35 minutes until golden brown and take it out and let it cool completely in the pan so that we can slice it more easier later. So for extra touch, you can also garnish with your favorite nuts. So here we use chopped walnut for uh, their omega-3 goodness, but feel free to get creative. And lastly, use a sharp knife and slice it into 15 to 16 squares. For festive occasions, you can also get creative by drizzling some melted dark chocolate on top for extra sweetness. And I hope you enjoyed it. So now we have a little visualization to wrap it all up. So we spoke about a few things. Let's look back at what we spoke about and what we discussed. So first, we talked about eating a balanced plate, and this was seen through Canada's Food Guide as well. So they want half our plate to be full of vegetables and fruits. So we want to eat our rainbow. And then a quarter of our plate to be full of our proteins and fats. And lastly, the quarter to be full of whole grains and starches. We also want to make sure, like Angie mentioned, to make water our beverage of choice to stay hydrated. And you can definitely have fun with flavored water options like we gave earlier and consider teas and coffees, but obviously don't overdo them. Again, over that limit is where it becomes a little controversial. And then limiting sugary beverages and alcohol is always a great choice. 
and make sure you choose more whole grains over refined grains for the added benefits like fiber among more. And lastly, to enjoy unsaturated fats rather than the saturated ones. So we want to increase our intake of omega-3s, which are an anti-inflammatory agent. So you can do this by adding more fish, nuts and seeds and pulses to your everyday meals and snacks. And the ratio between the omega-3s to 6 is what matters in terms in the context of inflammation. So we want to have a higher portion of omega-3s versus omega-6s. And lastly, we spoke about oils and its smoke points. So using the proper oil according to their use and temperature, they're going to be put under. So now that we wrapped it all up, I want you to keep in mind Canada's food guide. And what we're going to do is a little activity, but for the sake of making it easier, I think we're just going to get Angie to walk us through it. What we want to do here is we just see a plate of spaghetti, plain, nothing on it, just the spaghetti. And what we want to try to do is make it one more of a balanced meal. So following Canada's food guide, making it more balanced Two, seeing what kind of anti-inflammatory agents, anti-inflammatory foods. So looking at our phytonutrients or antioxidants, fiber and omega threes. How can we make this meal more balanced, more full and nutritious? And lastly, how can we make it more in the context of reducing inflammation? So Angie, you can take it away. Walk us through it. Thank you. So now I'm going to share with you my idea of how I'm going to decorate this pasta dish. So first choose whole grain pasta rather than regular ones to have extra fiber and phytonutrients. And to make it a meal, I would add a quarter plate of protein with healthy fats. And more specifically, you can uh, choose salmon or tuna, which are rich in omega-3 fats. And you can also add one to two pieces of chicken breast on the side, which is also good protein option and same for legumes. Uh, to make it more nutritious, I will fill half of my plate with a refreshing salad. And again, you can choose whatever you like, uh, either chopped uh, cooked vegetable or salads um, and dress with anti-inflammatory olive oil and some extra herbs and spices for flavor. So here we provide you several options here, for instance, sage, oregano, basil, or parsley. And one last message I would like to put on light on again is always choose water as your first choice of beverage. But most importantly, it's all about an enjoyable experience. If you find water is too boring, you can also um, try to infuse it with um, fruits or vegetables, as I mentioned, and some people may not prefer drinking during mealtime, no problem. You can also enjoy a cup of coffee or tea after the meal and enjoy it. Thank you. This is the end of our presentation. We appreciate your participation and um, engagement. Uh, if you have any question now, feel free to ask. We will try our best to answer. Thank you.